Okay, first of all, I want to praise God because Stan's gone and that's, we all feel that, but look what I got. I have Pam Bombas, she's on organ, her husband Bob Bombas over here. They're awesome people, if you haven't got to know them, get to know them. And then Sherry, my, my right arm, and... She's on your left, you know. Oh, but she's my right arm. That's on my left. But anyway... Uh, it's so awesome that, that they're here to help us, and you guys are my choir, so let's all right. stand as we sing, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. It's a good song. Yes, it's an E. I'm sorry. We changed it to the key of E, so everybody has to sing in the key of E. Yeah, right. <laughs> not so slow and this is going to be we're going to sing the first this has three verses right Chris okay this has three verses the first one we'll all sing the second one and the third one we'll all kiss a hand I mean kiss a cheek shake a hand kiss, kiss a, a foot just get to know each other just kiss say a foot hey yesterday. each other okay <laughs> I'm okay. not kissing your feet y'all I might wash them at some point <laughs> okay let's do it Show me. 
four times and y'all still would have been talking. That's great. have a seat. I think you've stood enough. That's great. <laughs> Next is uh, because of your love, because of God's love, that's why we're here. Thank you, Lord. in E also, yeah, you so y'all sing in ahead, E, sing it's in the secret, there's no end, this is it, <laughs> I mean, no, okay, <laughs> we don't know what we're doing, because, you know, yes, it's kind of do. a last minute, no. you guys just get to go along for the ride, aren't you happy? <laughs>
I should have said during the praise records and prayer request time, but, and I'm going to cry, so y'all just stick with me. <laughs> Yesterday, we came here to practice, and I, I left, and about noon, I get a call from my cousin that my um, little brother's two-year-old daughter had fallen in their pool and was found unresponsive, and my sister-in-law found her, and she pulled her out and called 911, and my brother was up front. Um, washing the car and he came running he did CPR until EMS got there and um, I got to say it's a miracle because that little girl is perfectly fine today she's been the nice night in the hospital but um, she is pretty much her normal self this morning being Henri so I just want to praise God for his protection over her you know because you know it could have been so much different so I did see that post late yesterday and shared that a little bit, Sherry, with the morning Bible study group. And truly, God was watching over that little child and that family. Uh, that could have been an absolute disaster. So we're thankful for God when he protects us. We're going to look at continuing who Jesus is, basically. We looked at last week Jesus as the revealed Messiah. Who is he? He is God in the flesh. He is the one who became our sin on the cross of Calvary. He is the mediator. He is the one who will judge according to his gospel. He is the one who brings the hope of salvation to a lost and dying world. And we would like to think that given last week's study and message, that Jesus has re been revealed as the Savior, that people would run to that. that. That would seem to be the normal response, that when we are in trouble and somebody offers us a solution, that you would run to that solution. But today we want to look at the rejected Messiah and ask the question, why would he still be rejected? If he offers us the solution to an eternal problem, why would people say no to Jesus? And there are some biblical answers for that. Again, some of it doesn't make sense to us because we live in a world that is self-centered. Uh, if you have not noticed lately, if you have been out in public in any way, everybody's in their own bubble. Driving down the road, most people are looking maybe 25, 50 feet ahead of them. That's about it. They're not looking down at all. Uh, how many times have people either run into you or you into them while they're texting, while they're on the phone, while whatever? Uh, you'll stand there 
uh, with, with the clerk at the store and you're needing some help, but they're busy talking to a fellow worker and the customer's totally ignored. That's the world we're in that is self-absorbed, it is self-centered, it is about me and where I am right now, and that's just the fact. It has always been that, but I do think the media uh, world we live in today accentuates what's always been there. It just makes it more apparent, it makes it more obvious. So today we wanna look at the rejected Messiah, and we're going to consider some reasons why that might be so. This is coming out of John chapter 5, verses 30 through 47. So you can go back. We're going to deal with most of those verses uh, as groups as we go forward here. But you can mark that and, and look at that later when you go home and, and read the whole context of what's going on. So in John chapter 5, verses 30 through 47, uh, we're going to deal with uh, the first, let's see here, eight verses in the first part. So let's start taking notes. Jay, you ready? Got it? Jesus is rejected when men, that means people, all people, receive a partial revelation of God rather than the full revelation of God through Jesus Christ. What I just said is religion will give revelation. The problem is not the full revelation. It's, it's a partial revelation. Therefore, you find people who are drawn into a place of worship and fellowship, but not because they have understood who Jesus is. Rather, they get a partial revelation of this is a good thing to do. This makes me feel better. I like to be with people. I like to be a helper if I can serve in some way. But these, by and large, are people that are within a religious setting who don't know Christ. They're lost people. But they feel okay because they're talking about Jesus. They're, quote, serving him and learning. And yet they don't know the real Jesus. This is the group that stands before Christ and in that last day will say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not feed the hungry, clothe the naked? Visit those in prison. Did we not? Did we not? Did we not? What will be his answer to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. What we do does not matter. It's who we know that matters. And if you know Christ, then the doing follows the knowing. But if the doing comes first, you're just being a good person. And uh, do-gooders do good in this world, but they don't have any lasting solution to anything. It's just being helpful, and when that, uh, that help is done and that event is passed, that, that's what you get left, okay? We need to know the full revelation. Here's what happened as Christ came into this world, God in the flesh. All of the challenges that we see in the New Testament the struggles that Jesus had that ultimately led to his death were against religious people who had a partial revelation of what God was doing. Their appeal was, but we're children of Abraham. And Jesus said, no, actually your father's the devil. But Moses gave us the law. Yeah, but none of you keep it, so you're held accountable for all of it. Everything that they threw back at Jesus as a reason and as an excuse that what they were doing was the right thing, Jesus put, put aside and said, it doesn't count. I'll guarantee you there are people sitting in churches today around the world that are sitting in churches, but they don't know Jesus. And there are many churches that those people will sit in that will never reveal Jesus to them because they won't teach who he really is. He's the happy Jesus. He's the son of God Jesus, but not God in the flesh. He's some other kind of Jesus. And if you get the wrong Jesus, you get the wrong outcome. So it doesn't matter, and I've had that discussion within my own family, that it doesn't matter that you talk about Jesus over and over again, you're not talking about the Jesus of the Bible. You're talking about the Jesus of another revelation, of a partial revelation that distorts who he is, and therefore the outcome is not a good outcome. John 5.30. 
I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Boy, did he put human ego on the line right there and say, you know what? If your pride is in yourself, then you don't understand what God's doing. If you think that you are the answer, if I just do the right stuff, say the right stuff, believe the right stuff, that that's the solution, no. Jesus, as 100% human being, said, I only hear from the Spirit of God, and I speak what I hear. I only do the things that my Father would do because I was sent to do that. So if you want to know as this unfolds, Jesus says over and over again, there is no way to the Father but through him. I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. He's not talking about the one and same within the Trinity. He's talking about if you want to know who God is, you can't leave Jesus out of the, out of the revelation. Jesus is God in the flesh. Therefore, he speaks as God. He acts as God, he thinks as God, he responds as God. So if I want to know what God thinks about such and such, go back and study Jesus and see what he did with it, and you'll have your answer. Let's start with this first diamond. I have to look at George every time to get diamond. John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus to come, the Holy One, the Holy One of God. We see that in verses 32 through 35. So what we're going to look at is these witnesses about who Jesus is. There's three of them. The first one is John the Baptist, okay? He came to prepare the way for Jesus to come. And what was he preparing? The holy way. Make straight the crooked paths. Tear down the obstacles. He was calling people to repentance to realize that we are broken people and we need to admit it before God. And therefore, he was not the way himself. He was the preparer of the way. He was not the light himself. He was preparing the way for the light. So he says this, Jesus speaking, There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not the testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. When Jesus came, many people continued to follow John and not Jesus. And we see that up until the beheading of John, much later in the story, where he is asking of Jesus who was his earthly cousin. Am I really, are you the one sent or not? And he got an answer very clear. Light has come into the world and blind people see, not physically only, but spiritually. And lame people walk, not only lame physically, but lame spiritually. All of us are crippled spiritually without Christ. And he went on down and said, these are the things. What do you think, John? Absolutely. God has entered into this world to offer salvation so that we can hear spiritually, we can see spiritually, we can walk uncrippled because he has healed us and made us to walk, okay? Those are the most important pieces of this. So John is preparing the way for the Holy One of God that he is uh, unbending in who he is. Jesus did not compromise. And sometimes we read through the stories of Jesus and his encounter with people, and we might misread it if we're not careful and say, well, you know, Jesus was able to give a little bit. He didn't. He didn't give a bit. When he held his ground, though, he did it with love and with salvation as the goal, with drawing people to salvation through Christ and not the other. So he was always consistent. You can't go back, those who, who approach the Bible as not the word of God but containing, you know, some truth in there, they would say, you know, Jesus was not always consistent. He changed his mind from time to time. Not at all. 
Not at all. He was always consistent. He always did the right thing. He always reached out to people, and if people, and he knew this. Did he save everybody? Did he heal everybody? Did he make all things whole? No, but he did make way for that to be a possibility for everybody. So Christ became the way to come to God. John prepared the way, but there's another witness. The works of Jesus are a witness that Jesus is the revelation of God. Be careful with this one, because those who look to the works as proof still want to use those works today as a continuing proof. So therefore, we have to have continuing healing and miracles and this and that. Those things may exist. They may not, because most of the stuff that's out there is not verified. It's just kind of hearsay. I don't want to totally get into that and say God can't do those things. He can surely do those things. But we need to understand when Jesus came with wonders and signs and miracles, those were specifically to be a testimony to who he was. And that testimony, uh, and I've just noticed this, not trying to be real smart aleck about it, faith healers also die. And they die of the same stuff as everybody else pretty much at the same time as everybody else. That should be the answer right there. If we are seeking for healing in this day and age and for that to be permanent, then you're misreading the Bible. Because as we looked at toward the end of this morning's Bible study in Hebrews 11, it talks about all the great people of faith and the one thing that keeps sticking out in that entire chapter is, and these died in faith not having received the promises. Well, that sounds like a ripoff. I thought we were supposed to get the promises. No, the promises are eternal. The promises are for new heavens and new earth. The promises for a resurrected body. The promises for a place where righteousness dwells and there will be no more pain or suffering. That's not here. That's not this place. That's the promises. All of us will die because this world will kill us. But that's not the promise of God. It's way beyond that. And Jesus suffered shame on the cross because of the joy that was set before him. He knew what was going to happen on the other side. And we need to be sure in that too. So be careful that you don't take the works of Jesus then on the earth to verify who he was, to prove to John that, yes, I am healing the lame, blind, and deaf physically, but it's bigger than that, John. It's spiritual. Those who have walked in darkness now can walk in light. Those who have been crippled by this world, they can find wholeness when they come to the cross. Those who haven't been able to hear the voice of God can now hear the voice of God because I've unstopped their ears. Those who have been blind to God and his presence and his working, now they can see that I have always been there and I have brought to them salvation. The works of Christ were proof to those then. To us, it serves as a looking back proof because we can see the miracles of Christ. And here's the one thing that I can do. I can verify the miracles of Christ, but I can't mer verify the miracles that are out there supposedly today. I, I can't do that. Now, I can feel personally that God's done miracles in my life. Can I empirically prove that to you? No. That's an act of faith on my part. That may be me grasping at straws. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't change my faith. A miracle in the life of a believer doesn't strengthen your faith. It just proves what was always there. And if it becomes something that we have to latch onto in order to function spiritually, we're misreading what's going on. The works were a witness that Jesus is the revelation of God. 536. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now, I don't want to go on until I say this. The greatest miracle of Christ is the fact that he can save me a sinner. And the greatest miracle of Christ is to heal and make whole the sinner who is forgiven and made a child of God. 
don't mistake it with the physical. The physical is just the outward shell. The greatest miracle Jesus does is to have somebody be born again into the kingdom of God because that is eternal. Not for a resurrection. Lazarus had to have two funerals, and they had to pay for it twice. And the many people over in Luke that in the crucifixion time in that three-day period, many graves were open, and the dead came forth to speak of God, and they went home, and they had to bury Uncle Joe again. Don't get stuck in the miracles, in the physical. The greatest miracle is salvation. The greatest miracle is God's grace and forgiveness that he should even care about us. That's a miracle. Don't get stuck in all the other stuff. Because you know what? Young people get old and they still die. Why would I want the miracle of... And not that any of us in this room would do that, but we spend a lot of time and effort trying to stay healthy. And then we still die. What's that all about? Well, it's called... Uh, free enterprise and I'll never forget what my heart doctor told me when I went for my first review he said you know what Tom I personally I don't care what you eat just stop eating so much okay just tone it down a little bit because for me to walk away and think that everything had been fixed and now I have to get on this rigid routine and I went to the heart doctor this last week, and he said, it's the best numbers you've ever had. And I said, I guess eggs and ice cream work. I don't know what else to do with that. So I think I'm going to go home and celebrate. <laughs> okay, enough nonsense. <clears throat> the works of Jesus point to, to who he is. They are simply verification. Let's look at the third witness. The Father in heaven is witness that Jesus has come to do his will. And what is his will? To save sinners. And that's back to the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is not birth. And, you know, our first one, that was when Beck and I were having kids, which we had pretty late in our life. That's why our kids are quite young still. It used to be, when I was growing up, men went home and they got a call later you have a child and your wife you can go and see your baby usually a couple days later so really my generation was the first generation where, where we were allowed the men to be in the room during the whole process and I'm telling you that was the most amazing miracle I've ever seen to watch my older daughter be born and then the nurse turn and say you want to give her a first bath yeah, I don't know what to do. I'll just go clean her up. That was an amazing thing to me. And then for the second one, too. That's an amazing miracle, life. But that's still not the miracle. The miracle is God saves sinners. That's why Jesus came, to seek and save that which is lost. John 5, 37 and 38. And the Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent him, you believe not. Let's say it more plainly. The reason people don't believe Jesus is they don't believe God. They don't believe the testimony of God that he would send a Savior to this world. They do not believe the testimony that God said, a babe shall be born, and he shall be born in Bethlehem, and he will be wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he shall become the Savior of all who turn their hearts to him. They don't, they don't believe that. They want to believe that God is something that people have made up over time and that religion is man-made. And to a degree, I would agree with that. But I'm not talking about my faith. My faith is not man-made. My, my faith is God-made. But all religions in this world are man-made and man-messed with. That's the problem even with the faith in Christ. If we tamper with what the Scripture has said about who he is, we have simply created a religious setting, and then lost people are able to fool themselves that all is well when all is not well. 
And the only way that the Father through Christ saves sinners is to convict them of their sin. And boy, do we not like that. Anybody in this room find extreme joy in having people tell you you're wrong all the time? I doubt it. And he says the reason that they don't believe is in verse 38. Let's not miss that before we go forward. You do not have the word of God abiding in you, and therefore you believe not. How many people sitting in a church today have never read the Bible, have never heard the gospel message truly, have never been broken before God because of their sin, that's called repentance, and realize that God is God and they're not, and God is holy and, and we are not. How many people sit week after week after week thinking things are okay and they've never truly heard the message that causes you to be broken first so God can fix you second? Until I admit before God who I am, there's nothing to fix because I'm okay. And through the years of ministry, I've had people just tell me whether they're church people or not, but I'm not a bad person. I've heard really bad people tell me they're not bad people. I've even heard it come out of my own mouth. Nothing wrong with me. I'm not a bad person. Well, not according to God's word. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one does righteousness. Not one, not one seeks God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And yet we're commanded to love God in that way. So apart from his spirit and being born again, those are impossibilities. Those are just religious ideals that nobody can reach. And if the church has become simply the purveyor of ideals and feeling good and being life coaches and making us, uh, you know, stop doing this and start doing that and you'll have a happier life, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. So for me to leave the hospital and think, if I just start eating right, I'll never have to deal with this. Well, the next thing that came out of his mouth was profound to me, and I didn't like it. He said, I don't care what you eat. Just stop eating so much. By the way, you have heart disease, and you will die with heart disease, and you will probably die of heart disease. And I just was in unbelief. Well, I thought you just fixed that. No, we just allowed you to live a little bit longer. We did some plumbing, okay? <laughs> See what happened? People that have a religious experience think they're fixed, and they're not. People that have a spiritual encounter, whether it was they went out and saw the Milky Way for the first time because they got out of the city, or whatever, and they have, they have this experience, a spiritual presence. That's not what saves. Jesus saves, and he saves sinners. And until we admit that that's who we are, he can't save us because there's nothing to save us from. If all is well with me, I don't need a Savior. But all is not well with me, so I need a Savior. Let's look at the second part. Jesus is rejected when people put their faith in their own belief system rather than, reve rather than the revealed Messiah of Scriptures. Why was Jesus crucified ultimately? Because he was revealed for who he really is. And people don't like that. And the answer, the solution was, kill him. He's taking away from the temple system and the buying and the selling. We, the Pharisees, Sadducees, religious of the world, he is, he is weakening our position politically and spiritually and economically. And we have to do something with Jesus. And we got to do it quick. Or else that's the end of us. That's how you can start sorting out political, religious rhetoric from scriptural teaching. Because one is going to offer stuff that it can't possibly deliver. The other is going to deliver exactly what it says. Salvation to the brokenhearted. Those who are poor in spirit will see the kingdom of God because they know they're spiritually bankrupt and broken. And their account says zero in it. In fact, there's a big deficit in it. And only Christ can solve that problem. Let me say this another way before I go on, because I've seen this, for those of you with me on Thursday, 
I've seen people who put faith in their faith. That's a big mistake. What do I mean by that? They put faith in their faith of spiritual gifts. Put faith in their faith of miracles and, and healings. They put faith in their faith of, well, that's what I've always been told. They don't want to hear what God's Word says because they can't. They're too busy believing in their own belief. And Jesus comes along and he cuts right through to the bone and marrow and he calls the problem what it is. And the living word of God uses the written word of God to convict us that we are all broken beyond belief. So when we as Christians become offended by the lostness of this world, you're lucky we don't see what it really looks like. Because most of us would just pass out from fright and fear. Honest. We are able to scratch the surface of what evil is, but to truly know the evil of this fallen world, I don't ever want to see. Because the horror of it would kill us. It abuses, it neglects, it murders, it tortures, it steals, it does everything that's wrong, it violates in every way it possibly can, any sensibility that we might have. And when people get caught in that, whether they're born into that, raised into that, it is a horrific thing that only God can get them out of that mess. Because there is no good program in this world to get people out of that kind of stuff. It's a lot worse than we may think. The revealed Messiah of the Bible is the Savior, not the one that we want to make up along the way. Now, let's, let's look at the first issue of this revealed Messiah because it is in the church today. And I'm talking about religious church. I'm not talking about necessarily the body of Christ. Keeping the commandments of Scripture cannot save you. That is a shock for many people. They will fight you tooth and nail to make sure that we have to keep the commandments. And as I shared with uh, the 9 o'clock Bible study time, and if you're for this, good. I'm not, okay? And you'll understand that and hopefully why. There's a big move across our country to save religious monuments or create religious monuments. And one is that we need to go in as Christians and go to the town square and put up a monument of the Ten Commandments. When Jesus said, I came to fulfill it and bring it to its end, now it serves as you're the one that condemns you. You know what I would rather see? I would rather see a monument that says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. So the monument closest to us was a, a good friend of mine, and he would call me regularly, is your church going to help that? What are you going to do? And I always weaseled out of it one way or another and kind of ignored it because that's not the issue to me. Jesus was put in the same position. Of these almost 700 commandments, which is the greatest? Now, were they trying to really get that answer? No, they were trying to trip, trip him up and catch him. <coughs> what was his answer? The greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in doing so, you fulfill all the law and the prophets. So why are we insisting on going back to keep the commandments? Okay, if you don't want to eat bacon, fine. If you want to eat bacon, fine. Just keep it out of my nose because I might backslide. <laughs> Things that are right to you may not be right to me and vice versa. I'm not talking about spiritual precepts as such. I'm just talking about there are people that Beck and I, when we first moved here, we had a couple that came through here. And in this neck of the woods, that's an East Texas saying, but it still applies here. People pass through here, especially in the summer, and they want to do concerts, and they tend to go out on the reservation a lot, and they, they travel around to little churches, and we come off, of, you know, do a love offering and this and that. Anyway, they came here about the time we were starting Passion Play, 
<clears throat> and I said, you know, okay, we'll do this. Uh, it was country gospel. That's okay. We probably have great lovers of country gospel in here. I prefer headbanging Christian metal, but... <laughs> so here's what happened. They came over to the parsonage where we were at, and basically their, their sign said, you know, had their names, and we do country gospel, and only country gospel. I said, well, can I play a song for you? I put on a less than gospel sounding song, and she about fell out of the chair. I said, do you even know what it's talking about? I can't tell with all that noise. I said, it's talking about being born again and the resurrection, being dressed in white. And she turned and she said, I knew you were one of them. I knew you were one of them. <laughs> and it just got comical. One is not good. One is not bad. What do you like? Enjoy it and thank God. If you like eating roast beef, eat roast beef and thank God. If you want to be a vegetarian, eat your vegetables and thank God. If you think one day is more important than the other, then thank God. If you think they're all the same, then thank God. It doesn't matter. It's that God gets the glory out of it. Now, do I recognize the fact that some of the stuff that I listen to from time to time can... Uh, elevate your activity level yeah but I don't want to go on a destruction spree I just have more energy other stuff will just plain old put me to sleep it doesn't matter these are things for you to decide does it honor Christ in your heart does it violate clearly scripture those are things that we can okay Jay asked me this question every Wednesday night oh I see you were listening to such and such, and he'll talk about it on the way up here. Well, that's okay. That's good. That's good. And then another time we're listening to some traditional. And he goes, well, that's good stuff too. That's good. We should do that too. Other time, right? Do I ever have the same kind of stuff playing on any given week? No. Yeah, every now and then. Yeah, yeah. I'm a kid of the 60s. The point is this trying to do things in a highly structured way serves to put you back into bondage of the law. It's called legalism, and it does not build up. It always tears down. It also shuts down God, too. Well, this is the problem when you have, you know, and these are, these are things of your own conviction. There are certain Bibles that I use for study purposes because they are good to study from. There are others that I read because it reads as a narrative. Is one right and one wrong? No, just know the difference and use them in their appropriate way. Can I drive a nail with a screwdriver handle? Yes, I can, but it's not the preferred tool. So figure out in your heart and in your mind, in your conviction, am I honoring God by what I'm doing? If I'm not, I don't need anybody to tell me that. I already know. It doesn't take me a whole lot to figure out, although during the week I tend to run around in T-shirts and shorts and flip-flops, that that's probably not how I should show up here on Sunday morning. And yet you've all seen me the other way. You see what I'm getting at? Keeping the commandments and then adding on to it is what the Pharisees were good at doing. When I was in seminary, I went to a house to work on. I did window and door stuff while I was there in school. I went to this guy's house, and he was uh, a Jewish man. And we got talking. He got asking me who I was. And he said, well, come on over here in my library. And he showed me this big wall full of books. And he says, those are all commentaries on the Torah to tell me how I should obey the Torah. And I went, gosh, that's a lot of reading man, that's a lot of restrictions. You could do this, you can't do that. At this point, we're almost sounding like certain government restrictions, right? How do we live without somebody else telling us what to do? Be careful that we don't take the commandments of God in their minutia and turn them into, as Jesus said to the Pharisees, you take a millstone and hang it around somebody's neck and throw them in the lake and, and drown them. But you yourself won't do it. You're, you won't even follow what you're telling everybody else to do. 
The scriptures reveal the Savior, not the law. The scripture reveals that the law is a tutor and taskmaster to watch over us until Christ should come. We are freed from the burden of the law. And by being freed, it's easier to keep the law, which is love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm glad when you're saved, God doesn't slam us with a big old book of rules and regulations. Those are your own struggles, okay? So go forth and struggle. Let me figure out where I'm at here. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are the, and, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. They found life by burdening people down with how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, what you eat, what you do on any given day, on any given time of the day. That's a horrible place to be. It's a much better place to be where I am simply free to love God and be loved by God. Gosh, that's easier. So scripture reveals then our lack of, of the love of God and our lack for God. Those are the kind of people that I would maybe rightly say they're Bible thumpers. Now that's usually used as a derogatory word even against self and, and you. But I'm saying that people that are so caught up in doing the right thing, presenting the right thing, that's, that's a horrible place to be. You are bound by the law and Christ has come and we know the truth, and he is the truth, and the truth sets us free. And he sets us free from the condemnation of the law, the rigidity of the law, and we are now free to love him back as he has loved us. I think that's a much better proposal. Isn't it interesting that we can search the scriptures and find everything except for Jesus in some circles? Isn't that an amazing thing? We can search the scriptures and never find the love of God through Christ. John 5, 41 and 42. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. Plainly put, that next one, Chris, Scripture commends faith and condemns unbelief. We walk by faith, not by sight. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. So when I find myself walking by sight, my own plans, my own uh, solutions, and all of that, I'm not walking by faith, I'm walking by sight. And at that point, I'm not pleasing God. I'm not unsaved, I'm just not pleasing God. God is much more pleased when he brings to us an opportunity to serve him and we just go ahead and jump right in and do it. I've had this conversation many times through the years in doing passion plays wherever a new one is started because I went through the same thing myself. When that ministry started here, it was myself and one other, other individual that signed the agreement to produce. And we had to come up with a board, and we had to come up with a certain number, uh, a bank account with some money in it. And the two of us got together and figured, well, since nobody else knows what we're talking about, I've got a credit card, you got a credit card? Then let's go put this on credit. And then I came to my senses and realized it's not mine to make happen. It's not my responsibility. All I have is the vision, and I don't even know what that is yet. So what we're going to do is go ahead and sign this piece of paper, and then we're going to go out and start sharing what's going on. And all of my pastor friends said, what is wrong with you? What are you talking about? And I said, I don't know, but it's the greatest thing. I'm going to be a part of this. I have no idea what God's going to do. Have you met with the church about this and had a committee meeting and discussed it? No. What I did tell the church is God's given us uh, opportunity and uh, I hope we all go but if you don't go I'm going anyway not as an ultimatum as an invitation 
And I'm so thankful that this family said, let's go. And when that couple came that was going to do the concert, I said, hey, come next door and see what we're building. I said, what is it? I said, it's a set for passion play, but we don't have a clue what we're doing. We're just building all this stuff. We don't even know if we can use it or not. How are you paying for this? And I found out that he was a fundraiser for a major college in the DFW area. I said, we're not. We don't know what we're doing. We just pray for a board, and somebody walks in the door and says, yeah, I was cleaning my garage out, and I got some boards. You need some boards? Yeah. The original set is down in Las Cruces. It got taken down there in April of this year. It came from where Big Five and Star and all that is down there. It used to be a lumber yard. And uh, I asked this friend if I could borrow his trailer, and I pulled it, and hee 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 That's how it went down the road. It's falling apart. And I saw this pile of junk out front, and I went in and asked, what are you going to do with that? And said, those are calls. If you want it, you can take it. And I took all of it. That's the first set of Passion Play. It went out to Shiprock for four years. Now it's in Las Cruces. It's the same junk that somebody was going to throw away that God used to prove a point. Do we have to know what we're doing? No, we have to have faith. Do we have to see the end from the beginning? No, only God sees that. I sat in here for our first meeting, and I had a sister of a good friend who came to see what Passion Play was all about. And there's about eight or so people sitting here. And Stan started talking about this ministry that's going to reach thousands. And I heard this lady go, <laughs> thousands. And she got up and walked out the door. We went to a meeting, and I said, Stan, is this okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. We had another meeting, five people show up. You sure this is okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's okay, don't worry about it. We had about five of those kind of meetings of, it's okay, don't worry about it, and I found out later he'd never done this before. And then we called everybody together at the college, and there was about 40 of us. He said, well, this is looking better. You need 80 to do the play. But I'll call Denver and see if they can come help. And I'll call Las Vegas and see if they can come and help, because we were the third one. Now there's 30 plus. And they came down to help. We never, ever practiced the entire play until the first night of the presentation. We were still building sets as people were being seated. We had never practiced a single scene with Jesus never even knew who was going to be Jesus till he rode in on a donkey. And I went out and made the first crosses, and they were solid, eight by eight, solid timber, 12 feet long, roughly 250 pounds each. Jesus really did bleed that first night because he dropped the cross on himself. And the Romans could barely even pick up the bases because, I mean, they were made to hold up a second floor building because I didn't know what I'm doing. <laughs> that night, we finished a two-hour play in three hours. And we dropped about 30 lines. That's almost a whole scene. And in the crucifixion, the scene came to a stop. And I was one of the Sanhedrin. All of us, almost all of us wore glasses. That's why I got contacts that next year, because I fell off the stage. I don't know how many times. Stan put on a, a, a costume because the scene had stopped, and he assumed we had forgotten the lines. And he came up and started looking, and he realized we were all standing there looking at Jesus on the cross and crying. We've never seen this before. We've never practiced this before. We don't know what to do with this. Did Stan make us go forward? He said, I just let you stand there and cry. Several people were saved that night. Jared was the first. He's now our board chairman. He came to me and he said, we're back there building the crosses. And I asked my dad and mom, did this really happen? Is this what took place? 
He said, I, while I was helping them and watching them build the crosses, that's when I knew I needed Jesus. And so I said, let's do something. Let's, we get the whole cast together and we made a circle around like this. I said, would you mind going out there with your mom and dad into the center and tell people what happened? He said, no, that's okay. That's how we started Passion Play. By sight, no, we don't know what we're doing. So we have a picture of Anne and a dozen more women next door sewing our first costumes out of bed sheets. Did it look really good? It didn't matter. It's not the point. That ministry is not about the location. It is not about the music. It is not about the costumes. It is not about the set. It is about the message of Christ coming to die for sinners. And the rest honestly doesn't matter, really. Now, we've put about 10,000 hours worth of work into the current set. But that set will never save anybody. And those costumes will never save anybody. And the fact that we present and don't miss a line and do it within the time frame, and we deliver the lines with conviction, and uh, no, that's not what saves. Jesus saves because he is either the revealed Messiah or the rejected Messiah. Third, Jesus is rejected then because of unbelief. People do not believe in God. They do not believe in his purpose of salvation. They do not believe they're sinners. They do not believe they need to be saved. They do not believe that Jesus can truly forgive them once and for all for eternity. They simply don't believe that because they have either no revelation or a partial revelation or they misunderstand and they want to have faith in their own faith. And so that brings us in, this is not on your sheet, but I think it's pertinent. Every now and then somebody will ask me, so what is the unforgivable sin? I want to give you an answer. It's unbelief. That's it. Well, I thought it was blasphemy on the Holy Spirit saying GD this and GD that. No. That's just simply an expression of unbelief. Jesus cannot save you from your own unbelief if you die in it. Don't get a second chance, no purgatory, no act two, no everybody eventually gets saved. None of that. Hear what I'm saying. Only your unbelief will keep you from being saved. Not the unbelief of somebody else. Not the unbelief of your family. Not the unbelief of your spouse. Only your unbelief will keep you from being saved. First, men, women, humanity, would rather, and that's the wrong here, so you can fix that, H-E-A-R, would rather hear the plans of men rather than receive the plan of God through the cross of Jesus. What I'm getting ready to say, I don't want it to be offensive, and yet it should be a little bit offensive. I grew up in a very traditional church where we did revivals in the fall and in the spring and so on and so forth and we did backyard bible clubs and we did vbs's and so on and so forth and all of those things are okay and good things but typically what happens is this children go to a vacation bible school and they are told the abc's of salvation and if you just learn those three things and repeat then you're saved and then they grow up to be teenagers and go, I don't know what happened. Then they grow up to be unbelieving adults. That's because they were unbelieving children. Folks, it's not Christian magic. God cannot forgive sinners until they're convicted of their sins. And let me go out on a limb here. Children cannot be convicted of sin because they're children. They're simply not capable of it. What if they die? God has them covered. When's the age of accountability? I won't answer that because I don't know. I would simply say this. Children can be taught that obedience is good 
but for them to under for me as a eight, because I was an eight year old when I accepted Christ. Did I understand sin? No. I thought that meant stop hitting your brothers and your sister, take the trash out when you're told, make your bed, say yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, and and and, it, and if I didn't do that, I, that was sin. Sin is an abstract concept, and children are concrete in their thinking. Roughly in the third, fourth, fifth grade, you make the transition from concrete to abstract. That's when a child can begin, I think, to hear the voice of God that has always been trying to talk to him. Because Jesus is always looking for lost, and he always starts early, and I'm thankful for that. And some children hear, and some don't, because they're never told. But it's not magic. It's not, I prayed the prayer. It's not, it's not I, I, I went to the altar and I cried. It's not any of that. That may be a piece of it. That may be part of your own testimony. That may be part of your own journey, but it's not a universal thing. It's not until in my heart I cry out, God have mercy on me, a sinner, that God can have mercy on me. By the way, that is the sinner's prayer in the Bible if you're looking for it. Remember, the publican is on this side of the street, not the Republican, the publican, tax collector. And the Pharisee's on this side, and the Pharisee looks up to heaven and says, God, I thank you that I'm a Pharisee. I thank you I'm not a woman. I thank you I'm not a stinking Gentile. I thank you that I'm not one of those kind of sinners. Amen. And the publican didn't even raise his head because of his shame and guilt. He fell flat on his face and he beat his breast and he cried out to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus asked a question, which one was justified that day? It's not a hard answer. So if you want to find the sinner's prayer in scripture, that's it. Now, I personally have not seen too many five and six and seven year olds fall on their face and cry out and not look to heaven and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Rather, they repeat a simplistic prayer and they do certain things and they're put on the church roll and they're baptized and all of these things. I'm not saying those cannot be real because they were real in my life, but it took me another two decades to sort through it. Rather than confuse, let's as adults walk in simple, humble faith before our God and Savior and our children will see it. And that's how they'll be brought to the cross. And if they are raised in an unbelieving house, God's got it covered. He's bigger than that. He will send people along the way to share the good news. And there will come a point in time that each one of us will make a choice. Do I believe in the Messiah as revealed, or do I reject the Messiah because I have my own version. Every one of us will have to answer that question. The last thing is this. Because the Hebrews rejected the commands of Moses, they will surely reject God's grace through Jesus and his command to love God, neighbor, and self. And that's true today. So that's a whole other discussion. If you want to have that, I'm up for it. But it'll take at least one or two pots of coffee, okay? John 5, 45, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Now, he's talking about the law of Moses, not Moses as the person individual, but he's the giver of the law on Sinai. He says you're putting your trust in the law to save you, and I'm telling you it's not going to save you. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? If we have rejected the revelation through the Old Covenant, ultimately that's fulfilled in Christ, there's no way to go forward. You're on your own. And religion won't save you. 
and churchianity won't save you, and being good won't save you, and having a certain philosophy won't save you, and believing in certain key Christian things that are out there in the field of which I disagree with most of them. It took me 30 years to get there. Those won't save you either. They'll just keep you in good company with other people who believe those things. Okay? Either we accept Christ as God who came in the flesh and died for our sin by becoming our sin. And through his resurrection, the miracle of the resurrection, verified who he is, conquered sin and death and Satan and this world. It's already a done deal. It's done. The outcome is done. We're just waiting for it to play out. I have to realize that Christ is the victor. And because he is, and I belong to him, I have victory. Not because of what I am, not because of who I am, not because of what I think, not because of what I do. When we stand before Christ on Judgment Day, my account will go something like this. Jesus died for my sin. What do you have against me? And when the book is open with my name on it, book of sin, you know what my page is going to say on it? Nothing because I've been forgiven. My page will be blank. No sin will be held against me. And you too. Your name is written in that book of life and it wasn't blotted out because of your unbelief. And the sins held against you will be zero, nothing, because they have been washed away by the blood of Christ. And nothing will be held against you. Now, why would we reject that? Why would anybody reject final thing whatever struggles you're going through right now and I've done this half a dozen times in the last few years I've met with couples who are on the verge of dividing through all kinds of circumstances there is, there is no pattern and I ask some basic questions and, and, and I try to tell them, you know, I really don't have an answer for you apart from this. Unless you let the love of God and the grace of Christ come into your situation, whether it's the loss of a loved one, loss of a marriage, loss of a business, loss of your health, unless you let that come in, you're done for. I can just tell you that. You won't get out of this unscathed. But if you're willing to let the love of Christ love you, your family, your situation, whatever it is you're dealing with, that will get you through. Does it guarantee the kind of outcome you want? No. The reason I can forgive other people who sin against me is because Christ forgives me because I sin against him. And I'm fully aware of that. And the minute I forget that, I will start holding other people accountable and I want some payback. And that's not a good place to go. So what is your solution to whatever it is you're dealing with today? The love of Jesus. That's it. And by his love, he'll give you grace you need. Is it going to be pain-free? No. In fact, it'll be the opposite. It'll hurt like you can't believe. Because God's healing gets all the way into the core of what's going on. And it's pretty painful to have this world ripped out of you piece by piece. I just look around this room and I'm, I'm aware of so many situations here of struggle and hurt and pain and sorrow, and that includes myself. And I just know the only way out is to accept the Messiah for who he is. Don't reject him. That would be a big mistake. Don't take the religious Jesus. That would be a big mistake. Take the free gift of God 
through his grace, through his salvation on the cross. And, and he, can, he can fix anything that's broken. He can. He's able to. Will he do it in this world to my satisfaction? I doubt it. Because that's Hebrews 11. And all these died, you know, all these people of faith died having not received the promise. Because God can't truly fix me until I'm dead and gone home. Because right now I still got this body thing that's all goofed up. And you too. Do we look for miraculous cures? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do. Will it happen? I don't know. No idea. The hard part is, don't get caught in the journey from A to B. Don't get caught in the start and the finish. The journey in between is what matters. And sometimes it's filled with sorrow. Sometimes it's filled with joy. Sometimes it's filled with brokenness. Sometimes it's filled with victory. It doesn't matter. The journey with Christ is what is important. And no matter how your journey unfolds, realize that that's a blessing to be able to take the journey and not be alone. I'm telling you, I'm looking here in this room, and there... I wouldn't want to trade places with any one of you what you're going through. But I also know you're not doing it alone. And if you're doing it alone, you're making a big, big mistake. Time will be on your side. Christ is for you, not against you. He will take brokenness. He will take sorrow. He will take shame. He will take pain. And he will use it in a way that will honor him and ultimately make you understand what he was doing the whole time. Okay? You okay, Jay? Got your lung and your Kleenex right now? All right. Let's pray. You're good. Here. Don't drink it all at once. We're going to pray. Pass that back to me. Thank you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, for you to reach us it's a difficult task because our unbelief gets in the way. Religion gets in the way. What the world is doing gets in the way. And yet you are faithful and you keep going to the core of the problem, which is sin. And you offer a way out. And we will have a choice to accept you as the revealed Messiah, the Son of God, God who took on flesh, who came and died for our sin, who is our high priest, who is our mediator, who is preparing a place for us, who has conquered death, who will give us the resurrection body, all of these things, or we can say no and reject you because we like our religion better, we like our own plan better, we like what the world has to offer better. And I really don't think, Lord, that any one of us sitting in this room would choose the latter. We, we, we choose you. Help us to make that very personal. Help us as parents to pray consistently for our children until they are at a position where they can hear your voice. Help us to do what we are supposed to do as a parent, to live in a walk of faith with you that our children can see. They're going to see the ups and downs of who our parents are. We're, we're broken people too, but they can also see the Jesus in us that you would use that to draw them to yourself. Father, help us to be grateful for our church family, that we don't have to do these struggles completely in isolation alone because that would surely do us in. But rather we can share one another's burdens and we can share in each other's joy and we can walk this walk with the rest of the body of Christ and we can all go home victoriously because you're going to take us there. Help us to see our faith in a different light, perhaps, as we walk out of these doors today. That it's something bigger, maybe, than we've considered. That it's something deeper than maybe we've considered. That you are doing a work in us that is going to be and already is an amazing thing. The miracle of salvation. Help us to see that and give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray.